Hello everyone. In this video we're going to take a look at return values as well as how they can be used with monitor objects. To start out with, what is a return value? What are we talking about? Well, if you look over at the manual, uh, you'll see a section called Object Related Functions, Chapter 13.9. And of course this section lists out a lot of the built-in functions that are available in Lemur, which you can check out on your own. But you'll notice this word returns appears in a lot of the descriptions. Returns, 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 returns. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, it means that this function gives you something back when it's finished working. For example, we've used getObject many times in previous videos and scripts to get the object that our script is currently inside of. So when we call the getObject function, it's actually giving us back an object, right? It's returning something to us when it's done. Well, we can use the return keyword in our scripts in the same way, either to simply exit a script before it's finished running, or to get a value back from that script. So let's head back to Lemur and see how it works. I've created a number of extremely simple one-line scripts. This one's called return number, for example. So you see, you simply type the word return followed by a value. Now, I've created several different ones here to demonstrate that you can return different types of variables. You can return a string in single quotes. You can return a vector, you know, several values. Here we have three values separated by commas and enclosed in braces. You can of course return a number as we just saw, and you can even return an object, which is what the getObject function does for us. Now what's really interesting is that we can actually make use of the return values of functions using monitor objects. We've always referred to specific variables within objects. Here we're getting the value of fader.x, which is inside of this container object. Here we're getting the multiball's y variable, so we've seen this lots of times, no need to explain that further. But what you may not know is that you can actually use monitor objects together with functions so long as that function has a return value. This monitor, for example, is running the return number function. That's the function we saw a couple minutes ago, which is simply returning the value 1, 2, 3. As you might have guessed, each of these monitors is actually running one of the four scripts we looked at earlier. Return vector, return string, and return object. So while these are just very, very simple demonstrations of what it looks like to return a value, what this means is that any script you create, you can use a monitor to inspect the value that gets returned by that function. One cool thing you can do is to use a monitor with built-in functions like we saw in the manual a while ago. In this case, we can use getAttribute, which we've also used in the past, to get the content attribute of the label object. Instead of needing to write a separate script, store the result into a variable, and then use the monitor to inspect that variable's value, here we can just now call getAttribute directly in a monitor. So in this bottom section down here, I've set up just a, a simple demonstration of how return values could be used to produce a little bit of an interesting result. So here we have three faders. Uh, there are no scripts attached to these faders. They're just, they're just faders. And here we have a multiball object with one ball inside of it. Now the multiball object does have a script called getValues, but we'll take a look at that in a moment because it relies on another script we've written called faders min max. Now that's up at the top. This one's a little bit longer than scripts we've seen before, but it's not too bad. On the first line, we're just compiling all of the x values of the three faders into a single vector so that we can later use the for loop to check for the minimum and maximum values. Here we're declaring the four variables that we'll use for the rest of our script. We're assigning the minimum value to be the first fader, that is the first element of this vector. And to begin with, we're also going to assign the maximum to be the same thing. Now because we've already assigned those first values, we're not going to start at zero, we're going to start our loop at one. And we're going to repeat a total of two times because we have three faders and we've already taken care of the first fader. So as we step through these, we're going to refer to the fader that i is currently referring to and check and see if it's greater than what we currently have stored as the maximum value. If it is greater, then we'll store the current fader's value into max. Then we'll do the same thing for min. We'll check to see if the current fader's value is less than our current minimum value that we've stored. And if it is, then we'll store it into min because it's the new minimum value. Now when we're all done with this, we just compile a simple min-max variable that is a vector which holds these two values we've just created, and then we return that vector. Now this step isn't exactly necessary, this is just for clarity. You could simply write return and then put the min-max vector here. So what does this mean? 
This means that whenever we call this faders min max function, we get back a vector that has the minimum value of all the three faders as the first element and the maximum value as the second element. Because we're able to call functions directly within monitors, we can create a max monitor here, which calls the faders min max function and then immediately extracts element one from the vector. Same with the min. Instead of element one, we're looking at element zero because that was our minimum value. Now the final thing I've done here, just as an example, inside the multiball object, we've got a script called get values. It uses the minimum value to control the x variable and it uses the maximum value to control the y variable. The reason we have these if statements here is simply to prevent the same message from being repeated. It could cause unwanted results if you were actually trying to use this multiball to send out MIDI data, for example, and the device that's receiving those messages might get overloaded with hundreds of repeat messages. If you don't understand that part, that's okay. This was just a little bit of a, an extra thing I threw in there. All right, the last thing we can do just to play around with this a little bit is to go and change the physics mode on all of our faders to be mass spring. I've set the speed to be different for each one of them, and I've also changed the friction down to zero just so they can run freely. So now if we just start them, then we can see that our faders continue to go up and down, and that our multiball's ball is being affected with the x and y coordinates corresponding to the minimum and maximum values. All right, hopefully this was something new for people. Maybe the idea of return values was something you already knew about, but now you're able to take advantage of those values and use them along with monitor objects or other scripts. Thanks for watching.